Welcome back everybody. It is July of 2022 and this is episode 43 of What is on My Desk. So here we are everybody back for another one of my monthly video updates. Bit of progress to show you today. We've got the uh, starting of the um, four 109s uh, going on. So we'll take a look at the progress there. The completion of the previous models has been done. The Meteor and the uh, Dauntless are both done. So we'll see that. We'll see the start of these four kits, as well as a couple of new items. I picked up some new books. We'll get uh, those introduced to you. Got them over at the uh, Vintage Wings of Canada Fly and Breakfast. They usually do a book sale on every one of those to purge out some of the duplicate books, as well as ensure they can raise a bit of money to help the collection going. So I'll show you what I got from there, and then uh, we will move along to the desk. So on that note, I will get swung over to the desk here, take a look at those books. But before we get into that, my name is Sean, and this is Sean's Aviation. desk we'll take a look at those new books I purchased as I said I got all of these at the uh, Vintage Wings of Canada uh, fly and breakfast that they held um, the other day and uh, we're gonna start with there's four of them I'm gonna show you I'm gonna start with um, one that is different and the other three are related so the one we're gonna start with is this book um, this is actually a pretty interesting book, to be perfectly honest. Uh, it's, it's, as it says, it's an illustrated history of World War II aircraft turrets and gun positions. Now, as you go through, the pictures are quite impressive. Um, there's quite a few different aircraft involved in it. It is a relatively new book. It was published in 2001 um, and again in 2006. Um, so, there, again, relatively new book. And, um, yeah, it is, is a very interesting book. So it starts off sort of a history of aerial gunning, and then it moves on to the specifics of a number of different aircraft. Um, you see some highlights of the different weapons that were used. And then we look, at, so it's, it's broken down into some multiple sections. So the first half is four-engined. So it's the B-17, the B-24, the B-29, and then the Lancaster and the Halifax. And for each aircraft, there's a bit of history of the aircraft and then some detailed kind of close-ups of these different um, these different positions. So uh, this here is from the U.S. Air Force Museum. Um, I don't know where this one was took. It's definitely one of the modern airworthy aircraft. I don't know, as I said, where that one was taken. But you can see there's a couple of pictures of in-air shots from some and then others that are shot in the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton. Uh, so it's a pretty interesting book to go through and see all of the detailed shots, you know, the ball turret interior and, and, and moving through the waist gunner's position. Um, it's very, very interesting. Um, moving on to the B-24, you can see how, again, you see the interior, some of the turrets and the views that the gunners would have. and some close-ups of the turret and the interiors and really, really nice photography. Um, these are all taken from the inside of Fifi, the Equipment of Air Forces B-29, so you can see uh, some of the interior shots as well. So it moves on to the Lancaster and again through that and then the, um, the Halifax. I'm not sure which Halifax they used. Uh, looks like they did the photography at the RCF Museum in Trenton which is definitely uh, interesting, um, nice plane. So we move on to twin engine. Again, a nice selection of twin engine aircraft. And again, you know, just some of the photography is just beautiful. The detail shots for anybody who's doing models or anything like that to get some nice detailed shots of the gunner's positions. Always, always beautiful. Um, yeah, just amazing. And then you move off to like some of the single seat ones. Like these are actually taken here at the uh, National Aviation Museum here in Ottawa from the uh, turreted, turreted um, 
Great battle. Anyways, beautiful, beautiful uh, book. Nice just reference picture book. It's always good to look through that. Um, worth the purchase. I paid very little for all of these books. The other three are related in the sense that they are part of sort of a series. Um, there's different kind of versions of these books. I actually have sort of an earlier version of this series. Um, these two are of the same series. These two are from um, the Janes series, but they're roughly the same. Um, so it's kind of cool to get an addition to this series when you can. Um, the books are very detailed in terms of, of how they... Oh, this one's actually been all marked up for some research as well. But yeah, lots and lots of research. All these pullouts that show all the different versions and the history. Um, always, I, I, that Lancaster book was a book that I used to read a lot when I was a kid. So to have some of these sec these these pullouts and stuff, it's it's really interesting. Nice addition to my uh, collection with that, and then like I said, these two are part of the Jane series. Uh, effectively the same style book, just published by a different publisher instead of uh, the um, the Crown, but they're effectively the same series, the same style with the pullouts and the cutaways and the big giant. Um, plates with the schemes on them, so um, very, very uh, interesting. Again, nice reference material for um, for a model builder or just anybody who's interested in aviation. So um, that's the Stuka, and then there's the BF-109. This is actually going to come in handy considering what... Um, What I'm doing currently with the um, the four 109s that I'm currently building. So this is just a nice little addition to see, make sure that I'm doing things correctly. Um, lots of references in here. So yeah, lots and lots of lots and lots of reference material. Actually, I think that's the exact aircraft. And you guys are completely out of frame. This is one of the ones I'm actually building of that. Um, I'm pretty sure that's uh, that's one of them. So, but yeah, like I said, just tons and tons of reference material for anybody who's interested in looking at stuff. Well worth the price I paid for um, all of these different uh, different books. So, those are the books I've added. <clears throat> Um, they're nothing special. They're just nice to add to my current collection. And uh, on that note, let's uh, swing back. We'll take a look at those two kits, the Dauntless and the Meteor, that I completed. And then we'll get looking at the status of the 109s. And here we are. Take a look at the finished models. If you saw last month's uh, video, if you haven't, I'll put a link up at the top. Last month's video included the um, L29. This month, I'm going to show you the finished of the other two. So here is the Dauntless. Turned out very well. Very happy with uh, how it uh, came out. Uh, over, I wish I had maybe done a little bit more um, weathering with the dark blue on top. It's a little monochromatic. Kind of could have done a bit more on that if I really, really wanted to. That would really be my only criticism of, of, of the build. Otherwise, I'm very happy with it overall. Weathering turned out nice. I like the, uh, the fading in the colors, uh, the bottom. Um, uh, very well detailed, uh, weathered, it looks, to my eye anyways, very realistic in what you would expect to see on a plane, a dirty plane flying on an aircraft carrier. Um, it looks great. I'm very happy with it. Um, it's going to look good on the shelf. I'm probably going to take this one to my shelf at work, uh, get it on display there. And, um... Accurate miniatures, uh, fiddly at times, but overall very good, very well built. I wish these flaps would open up a little bit more. I was a little surprised at how little they opened. I expected a full, a full opening, not this partial opening. But it still looks really good with the red peeking out at the back. Just a hint of, of color on this to uh, break up that uh, that navy color scheme. So that is the Dauntless again. Very happy. It's gonna look really good on my shelf. And then we've got the. 
Meteor, the Tamiya 148 scale Meteor F1. It's very, very finely balanced on the, on the mains. If the shelf it's sitting on is just slightly out of level, it constantly wants to tail sit. So I kind of, if I'd known that, I would have tried to squeeze a bit more weight into the nose to balance that out. But I mean, it is what it is. It still sits on the nose if you balance it properly and you do what you need to do. Overall, very happy with the build. Decals were a little iffy. Um, it was really the first time I'd have any significant issues with Tamiya decals. I don't know why this particular kit did that, but I still have the ability to pull the cowling off. Take a look inside at that engine compartment if you choose to. I can kind of put this, you know, wherever you want to put it to to balance or to, to have it sitting beside the model. Or you can just put it on. I can choose what I want to do. Looks really, really good. Not much I can say. Um, turned out good. Decent detail. A standard kind of Tamiya kit. Goes together relatively easy. Uh, not a lot of putty was needed on this, so very, very impressed. Um, Gonna look good on the shelf. I'll probably add this one to my collection at work. Um, so we'll see. I'm trying to, my work collection has to be smart with what I do with my models there. I don't want to have anything with nudity on it. I don't want any German stuff on it. You know, nothing with swastikas, all that kind of stuff. I gotta be careful what kind of, what I show off while I'm at work. So I have to pick and choose, you know, a little bit more judiciously. I think the, uh, the Dauntless kind of doesn't, isn't too bad to put on display. Whereas things like, a, you know, a German dive bomb, like a Stuka or a 109 or you know, any of my other sort of planes that have some, some more, or more overtly, you know, war. I gotta, I, anyways, I have a system. But on that note, those turned out really well. So let's uh, take the time now. We'll take a look at the next kits I'm going to build. And uh, we'll move on and get some of that brunt. So you'll see the next, next step is going to be the next kits and then, at the end, I'll have a little bit of the uh, progress on those kits because it's still quite early in the month. So I have a few weeks still to get some uh, some work done on those models. Uh, so let's uh, let's jump over and see that now. Okay, a quick introduction on my next set of kits. Um, I'm going to be doing a series of uh, ME109s and variants uh, for my next round of models. Um, there's going to be four kits that I'm going to be building. There's one kit that I started many years ago and never got around to finishing, and I'm going to probably finish it off while I'm doing this, as it is a 109, more of a what-if 109. Um, but we'll get to that in a second. So starting off um, right from the get-go uh, is my Tamiya 148 scale ME109 E4 E7 Trop. Uh, now this is the tropicalized version, so it has the addition of the, it's a little bit of a later Model E, so it has some minor changes versus the Battle of Britain E, but it also includes the tropical, tropical filter if you want to do this desert scheme, which is probably what I want to do here. Um, this desert scheme here is the aircraft I'm going to build. So some uh, not, not a lot of changes, just some minor uh, differences between this and an earlier sort of Battle of Britain E7 or E4 E7. Uh, so the kit itself, I do have uh, kit reviews coming out for all of these, so stay tuned on the channel. I'm just going to do a quick intro on this, nothing crazy. Like I said, there will be a full review on every kit. Uh, so this is the, the standard kind of Tamiya um, kit. You've got all of your basic parts. Um, detail is great. It's an older kit. I believe these were from uh, yeah, 1998 when this molding came out, so it's already, you know, a 20... Oh, what does that work out to? 24, 25 year old kit. So I mean, it's definitely not a modern kit per se, but for its time and even today, it holds up as a really, really well detailed model. So you get your fuselage, um, all of your cockpit interior bits. You've got a pilot, not a big fan of Tamiya pilots. They tend to be really dumpy and fat and misshapen, but I don't usually use them. But you've got your cowlings, upper and lower cowlings, your exhausts, uh, more of your cockpit stuff. Here's your two filters, your regular filter and your tropical filter, depending on which version you build. Uh, over here you've got your upper and lower wings, your flaps, your ailerons, or your slats, sorry, your reading edge slats, drop tanks, some of your landing gear and radiator parts, uh, the prop uh, backing plate, and then you've also got three different versions of spinner. You've got a blunt, a pointy, and the cannon armed one, so you can, you can pick whichever one matches the version of aircraft you're building, and then a nicely shaped prop. Um, so you get uh, everything you need to build a, a decently detailed ME109. You can see here on the inside of the fuselage sides, there's some decent detail here in the cockpit as well. If you wanted to do some dry brushing and some black wash and pick up the details, everything will just end up popping when you get to the end. Um, instructions, actually, so 
clear bits, uh, very, very nicely molded clear bits, clear, uh, very clear, really. Um, so proper masking, that will turn out looking good. I'm not entirely sure what's, how each one's going to be built, which one's going to be geared up, which one's going to be geared down. I'll make that decision later, but I'm going to be building between, I guess it's five 109s I'm building. I'm probably going to have three with the gear down and two with the gear up. I just don't quite know yet which one will be which. Um, instructions, you do get a full painting guide for the, the uh, desert scheme, which is the scheme I'm doing. So you can do the uh, cut these out uh, and make templates out of them to do your uh, camo on the top, which I'll probably end up doing. I did the same thing with my um, my Falkwolf 190s back at the beginning of this year. Uh, the whole channel, really, that was one of the first kits I did. I did that same technique, and I'm probably going to do the same technique with this, um, especially on the wings. The fuselage it's a little harder to do, but for the wings, at, at minimum, I'm going to uh, I'm going to do that. It uh, it does make a really interesting. Um, look and it, it makes it uh, it comes out looking really well so I'm gonna do that instructions are your typical Tamiya a big wide long sheet that gets all folded up um, so you start with your your cockpit construction uh, instrument panel um, and seat belts are decal options if you choose you then assemble your fuselage together then your wings and then your uh, nose section with the radiators and the flaps and then all of that all gets put together uh, horizontal stabs with the support braces uh, and then you get to choose whether you want the flaps up or flaps down uh, depending on how you display so that is there and then you move into this area here it shows again which parts go where and what to cut to do the different options and then you go into your uh, main landing gear your drop tank you put some of the stuff on the bottom the radiators on the bottom your uh, mass balances your tail wheel here's where the main landing gear and the drop tank goes in place your propeller and it shows you which spinner to use for which version you decide to build you then get the cockpit going together also use the um, armor plate and again it shows you each version has a different uh, modification you need to do for that armor plate step 11 is when you put everything together um, whether you choose to do the short or long tropical um, filter you, you choose their cockpit propeller all that kind of stuff and down here it shows you uh, the different variants on the cockpit open or closed and the extra armored glass if you choose to go that route and then here you've got your stencils uh, which are common to all the aircraft paint schemes and then you go into your paint schemes which again takes up quite a bit of instructions so scheme a uh, which is here uh, is from jg26 which i believe was based in i want to say italy it doesn't really say i'd have to do the research but i believe this one was based in italy um, and it's the uh, it's two tone green, uh, green and and and, and uh, gray over light gray, and then this is actually interesting because the splotches are shadow splotches. One color goes underneath, and the other color goes on top. So it'd be a bit of effort to get those splotches looking right because of the double layer you have to do. Um, upper and lower camo is very simple. It's just the standard uh, sharp lines uh, with the solid underneath. Um, I also believe it has yellow cowling, and the yellow rudder could be white. I believe it's yellow. And then you've also got, um, yeah, it's yellow, because here you've got your red and white uh, spinner. So that is option one, or A. B is from JG27. This is the desert scheme. Um, it's overall light gray, and then it's got a, I, I believe it's got a green or a, a, tan, a tan top with brown splotches. Uh, that's that version that was on the side of the box. Um, and then uh, this is also gives you the full color call out. Uh, for that if you choose to do that one it's also uh the spinner i believe is uh white and if you look it up again i think it's white and black on the spinner but it's got a bit of a like swirl instead of being a straight line um, so a bit of extra effort needed to get that but not terribly hard the first one was from jg2 uh, flown by uh, helmet wick who was a uh, relatively good um german ace uh, you see all the tail uh, kill markings on the tail uh, this one's a very difficult scheme the, the top and bottom is pretty basic it's the same splinter with the light gray but it's got all of these tiny little splotches on the side and again i wouldn't even begin to guess how to do that the best thing i could think of is to take a stick a toothbrush and kind of flick the toothbrush onto the side after you paint it so paint the, the upper and lower color and then kind of mask everything off that you don't want this flicks on and just kind of go through and and flick the paint and just get this random splatter look on the side. No guarantee it would come out looking right, but that's the best way I could think of doing it. But I'm not going to take a chance. I'm going to stick with 
the easier of the schemes to paint. It's also the more of the deserty scheme, which is what I'm going for. So that is the Tamiya um, 109E. Next up, I have the Edward. Uh, it's at the bottom here. The Edward 109G6. Now this is just the over trees, which means it does not come with decals. It is just the plastic. It doesn't even come with instructions. I'm gonna to have to download the instructions or follow the instructions online because they're not even included in this kit. I do have a set of aftermarket decals. I don't have them handy at the moment. I'll pull them out here by the end and I'll show you what I plan to do. Edward, this only costs like $20 to buy the Overtrees and you get a ton of plastic. Um, you get the G6 fuselage with the little bits and bobs you need to make the G6. You get the wings, which are pretty standard 109 wings. It's technically a K wing, uh, but that's the standard. This is all of the extra parts for 109, and it includes all the different pieces you need to make a whole bunch of different variants of 109. Um, you've got two, three different props. You've got this underbelly holder for bombs, a bunch of different types of wheel spokes. Um, over here you've got the interior bit for the wheel wells and you get different variants depending on what wing thickness you get. You get bombs, you get drop tanks, you get larger bombs, you get a multitude different amount of wheels where different tread styles and everything else like that. Uh, spinners, uh, there's, I think there's just the one spinner on here right now because it is um, just the late model spinner that's included. Okay, on the back side you get a multitude of different rudders depending on what style tail you do. You've got underwing gun pods, um, you've got a whole bunch of different bits and pieces here for like tail wheels and antennas and interior parts. Uh, it's just a never ending like amount of bits. You get a bunch of different types of exhaust stacks, lots of different options and it's good because even with the canopies you've got uh, one, two, three different style forward canopies, one, two, three, four, five different style main canopies, and a couple of different styles of the um, bulkheads, the, uh, the um, armor plate in the cockpit. So you have lots of different options. You can cycle some of these, some of these clear bits over to other kits if you are missing pieces and, and you want to make something look a bit better. So it gives you lots of options on there to do um, what you want. Now give me two seconds, I will pull up my uh, the decals that I purchased for this one. So that's what I got, a set of Barracuda Cals 148 scale G6 and G14. I haven't quite decided which one I'm gonna go with. Um, I'm thinking this one here with the white overspray would make for an interesting scheme. Uh, so would this one down here at the bottom um, with the, the bigger splotches. That would be an easy one to paint. Um, that one is possible as well. Um, to be honest, there's quite a few different ones. I think I like this one though with the white overspray. It just looks good. I can actually use my white, the same paint I used on the Stuka, that white tempera paint to give it a... Um, a look of like an in the field application of white paint. So I might end up doing uh, that one. Um, but yeah, and then uh, the decals for the 109, uh, the Tamiya 109 are right there. Um, so I mean, nothing terribly special with them. Uh, they're just sort of standard Tamiya decals. Um, but the G6, like I said, the, the Overtrees, if you're looking to do something with an aftermarket set of decals, then these, these, these Overtrees, Edward Overtrees, are a great sets of kits because they, they don't include all the extras. You're not spending money on decals and stuff that you're never going to use. Uh, it gives you that ability uh, to, to, to just pick up the plastic and do what you want with it. Uh, so moving on to the next two, they're both Hobbycraft kits. I'm going to show them kind of both two at the same time because they're more or less related. But one of them is the Hispano um, HA-112, 1112, I should say, the Bouchon, the Merlin engined version of the 109 built in Spain. And then we've also got the Avia S199, which is, if I get this right, it is the BMW powered version of the 109 built in the Czech Republic. Uh, they would have had a Daimler-Benz engine, uh, but post-war, 
The airframes are being built under license by Hispano in Spain and Avia in the Czech Republic. And in the post-war world, the Daimler-Benz engines weren't available. So Spain had access to Merlins, so they re-engined the airframes with Merlins and flew them for a number of years after the war. And then Avia had an, uh, uh, a warehouse of these are uh, the Jumo, sorry, they're Jumo engines. They had a warehouse of the Jumo engines left over and they started adding those to the 109 in order to keep flying the airframe a little bit longer. Uh, and as you can clearly see, this one is from uh, Israel in the immediate post-war years. So the, the two kits are very similar in terms of the plastic. Um, you'll see when I open the, the wings are pretty much common. I'll get them both open. We'll do a comparison as we go through here. So the everything is falling. The the wings are pretty much the same. Um, the only difference uh, is the wheels on this one, but they're the exact same molds for the two sets of wings. Um, the fuselage obviously is a little different, as this is the. Uh, Jumo powered one and this is the um, Merlin powered one um, but more or less um, you know this is specific for the Avia uh, and this is specific for the Bouchon um, and if you start with the Bouchon you get the fuselage halves there's a little bit of detail in the cockpit but not much and then you got your uh, uh, covers for where the radiator or the uh, sorry the cylinder heads go on the top and then your um, some struts some um, exhaust stacks, your rockets front of the wings, your, your uh, wing fences, the four-bladed prop including the spinners, uh, your wing cannons if you choose to use those, the rockets themselves that go in the underwing. And then the, the uh, canopy is the early style uh, 109 canopy um, that is included in the kit and that allows you to build that, that Spanish looking uh, Bouchon. Um, if you wanted to go, there was a version of this that had the Battle of Britain decals, you could make up the Battle of Britain movie decals. Uh, and, and do it up like that if you wanted to. Um, so then the Avia includes uh, the late style fuselage for the Jumo engine, including the upper cowling, your uh, turbo covers that go down the side of the fuselage, your fatter um, uh, paddle blade props, some of your intakes and antennas, and your later model spinner, including your wheels. So that is all included. And you'll see here, these are exact duplicates of each other, and these are just the 109 G6 parts. So that includes the uh, wing covers, the cockpit, uh, the cannon, your cockpit pieces here, your seat, your instrument panel, your wheel covers, uh, your landing gear, your exhaust stacks, your horizontal stabs, your drop tank, and then the G model spinner. And again, you'll see it's the same thing over here. Um, this has the extra piece for the underwing uh, rockets, or the under, yeah, underwing machine guns. Uh, but other than that, these are uh, duplicate sprues that are just a basic 109 sprue. Uh, so you can see how this and the wings are the same, and all they did was put the different fuselage sprue in the appropriate box, depending on what version of the kit you're building. Now the instructions are typical, again, Hobbycraft instructions, um, very basic. Uh, the detail here isn't the greatest, but at least you do see how to put everything together. It shows you where everything should be oriented in the cockpit, what and where to drill holes, if you, depending on what model you want, version you want to build and what additions you want to do, how to assemble your fuselage, including how to get your uh, exhaust stacks uh, properly oriented. Over here, you get the wings glued together. You also get the canopies going on and all your little bits, your intakes, your uh, engine covers, your wing fences, your wing cannons. If you choose to do that, it shows you the measurements for how to center those off of a panel line to get them oriented properly. Your landing gears, including the proper angle to get the gear in the right place. Uh, your rocket launchers under the wings, if you choose to do that. Uh, your the uh, um, piece that blends the fuselage into the, the, the wing gets put on your tailwheel, all that stuff. And then here you get your spinner and your antennas. And again, it shows you what to drill to get your antennas in a proper place. And then for the paint markings, there's a couple of different options. Um, you've got your silver over blue. I'm probably gonna do the silver over blue scheme. I like it. This is a dark bluey purple color. Uh, and then this one here is um, like a gray green um, over, uh, light green over dark green over like a light gray, a very 109-ish uh, World War II scheme. Uh, so it gives you all these different options uh, to go through and build these different th different color schemes. Again, I'm going to do the classic silver over blue. They have one at the Aviation Museum here in Ottawa. I might try to do that one, that specific aircraft, 
Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's painted up the way it was when it was in service and I can build it. So I might do that version up uh, just to have that kind of connection to something local, which is always nice to do. And then the Avia, this is the Israeli version, which I said was used in the media post-war. Uh, you'll see that the initial construction looks the same. Uh, cockpit where everything goes, where to drill the holes on the wings depending on the version you want to build, the assembly of the fuselage, um, uh, including some of the extra bits and pieces you have to install. Um, over here, again, it's slightly different. you got the later style canopy, uh, your, your um, turbo covers where they go in the fuselage. It shows you if you have to modify them based off of the version. Look at your, your references when you're doing this kind of stuff uh, to make sure you get it right. Um, and then uh, all the different intakes and stuff that get assembled on the nose. Your landing gear, again, with the proper angles to make sure everything lines up. And then here you install your underwing cannons, your tail wheel, your drop tanks, your landing gears, your pitot tubes. And then here you get your props as well as some antennas. And again, it shows you where to drill uh, to, and, and the mounting points to get those antennas in the right place. Paint schemes. Most of them are this overall um, RLM2 uh, paint scheme, this, this gray-green. Uh, color scheme and then there's one that gets painted up in sort of an RAF style scheme. Uh, again, I'm probably going to go with one of these schemes over here with the red and white uh, checkerboard tails and the red spinner. I kind of like the look. I think it looks cool and it would uh, definitely kind of fit with, with uh, the look I'm going for. Now saying what I said earlier about stands, I think I might build the two Hobbycraft kits with the wheels up on a stand because the landing gears and everything are very undetailed. So I can kind of hide a lot of the, uh, the, the bad detailing by putting on a stand. And then the Tamiya and the Edward kits that tend to have the good detail, I'll put the landing gear down and the cockpit's open. And that way you can see the cockpit detail and everything on those ones that have it. And these ones, I'll hide everything inside the closed cockpits and the retracted landing gear and make it look a little bit more, um, I shouldn't say make it look a little more, make it harder to find the, the issues with the kits. Uh, decals for the Hobbycraft kits are here. Uh, the Spanish ones, it gives you the options for the white or you can paint the white. And it gives you all of your stencils. It does give you all of these decal options so I can customize the numbers. Hence why I'm probably going to paint it up as the one that's at the Aviation Museum here in Ottawa. And then the Israeli ones give you all you need to do to uh, finish that off. Um, and then you get the different roundels for the nose. And here's the, 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 the red and white decal. I'll probably use the decals on the tail. Um, it should fit nicely. But that's... Uh, that is that. Now I did mention that I'm building effectively five kits and I've only shown you four. And that's because, like I said, one of them I started a while ago, many years ago. I built it. I started to rebuild it as something different. Never finished the project. Now's the time I'm going to finish it. And it is this right here. It is the Tamiya 148 scale um, ME109 E4. This is the Battle of Britain boxing. And I had done this up in the Battle of Britain scheme. Actually, I think I did it up in an East Co Eastern Front scheme with the yellow on the uh, uh, with the yellow on the nose. I've tried to modify it to build a sort of what if German uh, naval 109, something that would have flown off of the Graf Zeppelin. Um, that's their carrier. So I did a few modifications. First of all, you'll see I'll cut the wings. Second, I modified the tail wheel. So the tail wheel, instead of being mounted vertically, is mounted rearward. And, and that idea was to get it um, a little bit farther back and I gotta put a tail hook on here and I'll come up with something to make sure that the wire wouldn't trap the tail wheel. But I'm just kind of modifying it a little bit to make it look just a little bit different than a standard 109. The wings I made with extensions. They do need quite a bit of work. I, uh, you can definitely see I did this when I was younger um, and really didn't make sure things looked good. Uh, this wing here has got a bit of a wobble to it and a bend. So I need to kind of fix that up a little bit, add some putty. I might even just have to uh, break it and, and, and re-glue it on a different angle, um, which I just did. But anyways, the idea with this, um, I might even keep it snapped like that. Uh, and because the idea was the wings would fold. And I think instead of having this giant, giant wing um, fold, and have this big wing kind of sitting like that, I might make it fold vertical and I'll fold the inner wing in. And I think that's how I'm gonna make the wings fold and still fit into a German aircraft carrier, is have the wings fold up like this and then have the inner wing fold down flat. 
and the upper wings would touch and then the wings would fold down and then fold down and then you'd have yourself a, a 109T, a long-winged um, naval fighter. You had the extra wing to get off the aircraft carrier uh, sooner and then everything would fold up quite nicely in order to, to stow into a, uh, a ship. So that's kind of the plan. Uh, the paint scheme I'm going to do is a standard sort of, uh, at the time, Battle of Britain scheme of the uh, the, the two-tone, uh, sort of the gray and green over light blue. But then I want to take that light blue, I'm going to add squiggles everywhere across the top and make it look like ripples in water. And that's kind of where my paint, uh, my idea for the paint is going to be. It's all going to be rippled. And I can do all that using just um, um, some putty splotches and just lay the splotches down and, and leave a trail between them like leopard spots and the spade paint when you pull that off you'd leave these these rough squiggly things and then uh, as because the wings would be folded it'd be very easy to uh, if, if you know if, the, if they don't line up probably doesn't matter because this will be hiding a lot of that detail but it'll be enough that when you kind of look in you'll see this sort of uh, different scheme that you don't normally see on a German aircraft so that's the plan for this I have all the rest of the parts here um, I, I, my only, I'm getting a little ahead of myself in terms of ideas. The only issue I have is the flaps. When I did this in my younger years, I didn't account for the flap, but I think I'm going to leave the flaps just hanging like that. Um, I feel like that's something that might have just been a, a, uh, engineering a compromise that the Germans used instead of designing a folding flap in their rush to build this. They just built the wing that hinged along a strong point of the wing but leaves the flap sticking out. And uh, it's just something they dealt with. So that's kind of where I'm going with. But everything else I have here, I've got the wheels, I've got everything here, and I've got the prop and the spinner and everything here to finish everything off. So I do have everything I need to finish this kit. I just need to go ahead and actually uh, build the kit. And I also came up with a bigger set of wheels, um, which uh, there was a reason why I went with the bigger wheels, I believe, back in the day. Um, it had something to do with an aircraft carrier. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not, as I do have here. But I see now these, I think, are too small. feel like those are just a little too small so I might go with the bigger the bigger wheel but yeah so anyways I have all the pieces here I just have to kind of come up with a plan and work on it luckily um, because of the nature of how the model is already partially built a lot of this I can push to the end and I won't really have to worry about this until I'm ready for paint which is still a while away because I have to finish all those other kits. So this will be something I will get to near the end as I build them and uh, I'll be focusing on the other four kits up until I am ready to start the painting process. So on that note, um, I'm going to wrap up this introduction of the kits. It has been a long-winded introduction for these kits. So let's jump over. Um, it's going to be a couple of weeks in my future, a split second for you, but you'll get to see the progress of where I managed to get these kits by the end of June. So let's jump ahead and see that. So here we are, um, taking a look at the 109s. We're gonna start kind of from left to right. Um, and the first one we'll look at is the 109E. So they're all basically at the same stage, which is the cockpit interior has been painted and I've picked out some of the details in black. Um, so this 109E, um, as an earlier version, had a lighter color gray, uh, RLM02 in the cockpit. Uh, so the light gray has been applied. Uh, like I said, I picked out some of the details. And then you've also got the um, control stick, which has been painted RLM02 with the black tip. And I've done the um, leather boot at the bottom. So that has all been painted. My next steps on this, it's basically going to be some black wash and then some dry brushing. And then I can start assembling fuselages and moving on to the next step. So, uh, again, not, not a lot of progress. Um, I have been busy the past little while. I'll go into that here in a second. Uh, moving on to the next one is the Edward uh, 109G. Uh, so, as a later one, it has the RLM66 interior. And, again, you can see I've picked out 
some of the detail in there, and then there's the main cockpit. I guess I forgot to show you the bits and pieces here from uh, the 109E, the cockpit and the uh, assembly and everything here. So that's going to be picked out with a lot of the details and stuff later on. Uh, some of them have decals for the instrument panels, which I'll be using. I will be doing that, as I said, after I do some of the base weathering and stuff. I'll probably do uh, black wash first. Um, actually, no, I'll probably put the decals on the instrument panels first, then black wash, then dry brush, then flat coat, and then move on. So there's the 109 uh, G6 from Edward. Again, um, like I said, base color gray, plus some black parts picked out, as well as the control stick, uh, again, with the black top and the rubber lower part. So that's one is that, and I want to make sure I don't lose. I should probably put those in the Ziploc bags before I do something stupid and completely lose them. Next up is the Hobbycraft Bouchon. Uh, you can clearly see the difference in cockpit detail with these compared to the previous ones. But again, I've got that gray color painted. I've picked out some of the detail in black. The center, the, the cockpit itself has been done. Again, you can really see the difference uh, between a cheap versus a good kit. I mean, really, considering what this was at the time, that's not bad. Uh, but it doesn't hold up at all to what you see on some of these. Um, which one's which? Yeah, there we go. So that's the cockpit. And again, the control stick has been painted. And it has the rubber leather boot painted on the bottom so it's ready to go and again the same thing's going to happen with all of these I'm going to do some work with I th with the instrument panels and then I'll be doing if there is a decal I have to look up again whether these ones include decals for the instrument panels or if they are I think it's just painted I don't think there's a decal for these early ones so the, the yeah, Tamiya and the Edward ones will have the decals applied to instrument panel and then um, everything will get a black wash Everything will get dry brushed, and then we'll start assembling. The earlier ones, the, the Tamiya and the Edward, have a few more bits and bobs i got to do in the cockpit before I move on. These two Hobbycraft ones will be pretty quick. And here's the Avia. Again, it looks exactly like the other one. Cockpit's done, some bits and pieces uh, picked out in black, and then the control stick painted with the leather boot. Um, so, I mean, I, I wish there was a bit more to show you. I don't have any detail painting done. There's no weathering done. There's no... Nothing special to show you, it's just basic cockpit painting. Um, as I mentioned, I have been busy the past little while. Uh, so out of the first half of June, I was finishing up the Dauntless and the Meteor. So once I got those finished, I moved on and started painting these. However, in the middle of that, I also had my trip down to Hamilton, uh, which actually happened last weekend to go to the Skyfest 50. There has been some content I've posted already. Um, I don't have any YouTube videos up per se, but there's some content over on Facebook. If you head over to my Sean's Aviation Facebook page, you will see some content over there from um, that show. I do have some video work I'll be putting up uh, soon. Uh, I want to get that done and get it up for you guys here on the YouTube channel. It's just a matter of finding the time to sit down and do the um, editing as usual. Um, again, work ha it's a busy week at work this week uh, and then Canada Day. And then next week, hopefully, I'll have some time to get some more editing done. And then moving into the week after that, I'm heading down to Thunder Over, Michigan on July 15th to 16th. So there'll be a bunch more content. I'll be there, hopefully, with uh, I'm going to be on Photo Pit on Arrivals Day, Photo Pit on the Air Show, plus the evening uh, night run. So between Arrivals Day, Air Show morning and afternoon, plus statics, plus the night run, I'm hoping to have quite a bit of content available for everybody here to uh, to look at. So moving in through to late of July into August, we should be seeing a bit of an uptick on some content on this. And then uh, some of this model stuff will be put to the side and then I'll step it back up again in the fall once we move into the winter time, getting some more of the completed models and some more review content uh, pushed out, <coughs> excuse me, onto the, the channel. So we are moving along. I do have content coming out, so don't worry. I still do plan to get out to the Aviation Museum and get some of that stuff done. It's just with everything else going on, trying to fit that in is not easy. Once the fall rolls around and, you know, the school's back in, uh, things hopefully slow down at work, I'll be able to do some more of that kind of stuff there. So that's about it um, for the progress on the models. We um, come back again next month for the final, uh, another one of these updates. 
hopefully, you know, we'll start to see some gluing and some assembly on these kits. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see them all together in the final kind of versions of the 109 I'll put together. So, um, a bit of a quick one this month, uh, but like I said, a lot of other stuff going on in the periphery of this channel. So, uh, stay tuned. I do have more content coming out, so please don't worry about that. There will always be enough stuff for you guys to stay entertained on this channel. And as always, if you like what you're seeing, please uh, like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment. If you don't like what you're seeing, leave that comment. Let me know what you'd like to see done better. I'm always open to suggestions. Doesn't mean I'm going to follow them, but at least I will entertain your suggestion at a minimum. Uh, so on that note, I'm going to wrap it up. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for watching guys and as always if you are interested in any of the content you see you can access my website at www.shawns-aviation.com uh, you can see all the uh, latest pictures of aircraft and museums and the build logs of all of my current models and past models on that site and if you're interested in any of this content uh, please click the subscribe button here on uh, youtube to follow more thank you very much and see you guys next time